mentality will be to, there to toss some runes into if I want it. Basically. It's nothing beyond that. Uh, press right click to see in the dark and to reveal living beings through solid walls. You can also see their fields of vision, as well as the visual representation of the sounds you make. Level 2 shows you important items through walls like security devices, weapons, ammo, coins, keys, or traps. Very nice court. What I have given you falls upon you, as it has to the others before you. Now I return you to your world, but know that I will be watching with great interest. Totally not threatening at all. No sir, Bob. <laughs> or uh, not threatening, but uh, you know, intimidating. That's you know, some Eldric horror is watching with great interest. Lost an old dream, Corvo. Lost an old dream. So. Now you see things here that weren't here before. These are tied in with the Void Seekers uh, Arsenal thing. Um, basically, it's all the pre-order purchases um, here. Uh, I will not be grabbing them. Uh, the only thing here that I'll actually even care about are the books. And all this sound is getting to me. I want to grab them just to stop it, but no. You see these statues. These allow you to get to equip more bits of uh, bone charms. Bone charms, let me just move away from there. Uh, bone charms allow you to boost your. Let's see what this the heart says. Oh Christ! As far as it doesn't burst. Oh, and it's got clockwork on the inside. But anyway, um, the statues allow you to equip more bone charms. I'll be getting them as is normal through the game. I will not be using these. The only thing I care about are these books. The Journal of Granny Rags, excerpt from the ramblings of a street denizen. Of course I'll tell you, dearie, I won't keep any secrets from you, in the end. All the dreary days of my life are like the windows of a house. From the kitchen I can see out into the garden where the leaves and stalks are brown and bug-eaten. You can see a little lump of dirt where something was wrapped in a blanket, and laid to rest among the rows of twisting vines. The front room looks out into the street, where the neighbours are all setting fire to their homes, barricading themselves inside. Small, warm and snug, dearie. The front room looks out into the street where all the neighbors are setting fire to their homes, barricading them inside. Warm and snug, dearie. Yes. I was paranoid. I read it wrong. I was actually stopping to check the time. I uh, was meaning to say this earlier, but this won't be a long set, though I'll be recording more when I come back. I uh, just uh, have to... just heading out for a bit, so... at half two, so... just keeping track of time. Uh, so I know when to end this set. Uh, don't forget about the bedroom either. It sees into a dreary alley where hooligans are playing a game with an old man. First two are hitting him with sticks, and the girl with them is kicking at his dry old ribs. Oh, to have those bones, to boil them in a pot. No no one lives in my house anymore, dearie. No one you would want to meet. Where I, When I lived there with my husband, we were fine, fine people. Vera Moray, everyone would say, your house is as grand as Boyle Manor. Better even. Your dinners are lavish, and your parties are the best. When that young Sokolov came to paint my portrait, I was nearly still in my prime. Radiant, he said, and he was just barely a man. So young, and painting all the best people across the land. Everyone wanted a portrait by his hands. All my friends. I was the only one, dearie, wet with his paint, glistening on the canvas for a pretty coin. But it wasn't all parties and paintings. Uh, I'm waiting to say, not, not a cockroach. Um, part of exile. My husband and I weren't always at home now. We travelled together, he and I, to the far ends of the isles, beyond even, all the way to the red cliffs of Bendicia, to dig in the rock and crawl through the caves, holding up candles and squinting at walls. Many precious things we came upon, but none so precious as the boy with the black eyes, theory. All those marks and bones, carved so deep and polished so bright. I brought the old bones home, hid them from my dear husband, then I learned to boil them and carve them myself. They make good presents, dearie. The little mute boy took them home. He loved them so. All the time he came back with new bones for me, holding them up so I could see it in his eyes, though his tongue was still. Granny, his eyes would say to me, carve these bones for me, make me another present. And he went so, and he went so far, so far, 
all the way to Dunwall Tower, the royal headsman himself now, my little mute boy, and his shiny, shiny sword. Better bones were what I needed, you see, better bones to carve and polish, scrape and gleam. My dear old husband was always tired. I made him soup, and then he was sick. Better bones was all, for my little mute boy carved in the name of the one with black eyes. After my husband was gone, giving away his bloody presents, I didn't want to live there anymore. So now I'm old, and don't have many presents to give to. Don't have money to give my presents to. It's shifting through the garbage for granny rags, and feeding the little birdies that gather at my feet. No one wants to have tea, ex uh, dearie, especially those rude louts in Bottle Street, Slack Joe and his boys, always meddling with an old woman, just trying to make her way. In the end, we'll be together with him, you and me, and the dreary night, with stars above and below, and always the one with the black eyes, dearie. Ain't that a joyful reading? If I do accidentally grab any of the money, I'll just keep that in mind and not use it. Uh, I'll write it down here and say, don't use 500 or 2,000. That 2,000 is if I grab it all. 500 per pack. Um, from what I've he heard, there's like only three really good rune, uh, bone charms in the pack. Only three really good ones. Uh, there's runes and bone charms. Runes are to unlock abilities and pass some passive stuff. Bone charms are uh, they have their own little effect. Um, that's separate from the list you saw there. Like, there's one bad one there that uh, remember the white rats. It uh, makes them not attack you, but that just basically means, as according to a review I saw on Steam, basically rat swarms will do slightly less damage. Because the brown rats will still attack you, or black rats will still attack you, the white rats just won't. Excerpt from a series of letters sent by a member of the Bottle Street Gang. You want the chinwag on Slackjaw? What, what he was like when we, were, we was young, before he got his name? Oh, he's got a cool head now, but it's always like that in the days before he was boss at the Bottle Street Gang. Time was, young Slackjaw wasn't such a reasonable man. Like most of us, he grew up on the streets, running with a pack of rough ragamuffins, avoiding the war, pinching whatever he needed, dark-haired and dark-eyed, smoking a pipe by the age of ten, born, uh, from, uh, for them born into, into the bottles or coming from the orphanages, so to the gangs, working with the mud larks, and no one wants that. Some got pressed into the navy, or put down in the mines by the Pendleton or Boyle families. As hard as it was in the streets, as long as we all got, at least we was free. By the time we wanted as we weren't little ones anymore, Zach Joe was one to watch. You would call the shots when we took down a farmer's cart or a sidewalk street vendor. He would come up with a plan, give everyone some part to play, and decide and split. Most of us just went along, because we weren't fast that we made out better like that. More food, more coin, plus n n none of us wanted to deal with Zach Joe when he was in a rage. He worked on a couple of big jobs with Black Sally across town. That was enough to get the attention of the other bosses. He wasn't just a street kid anymore. He was an up-and-comer. That meant trouble. Another guy who fancied himself as such was Mike the Fish, who was working his way up, running the protection racket among the factory women. One fine evening, we're all take, uh, taking in a bawdy show in the theater house. Mike the Fish and his lot are there in the cheap seats too, just down the aisle from us. Mike has a wild idea, he wasn't big on planning, and throws a heavy ceramic spittoon at uh, Slackjaw, hits him in square in the face, and breaks his jaw. We look to see if there's going to be a blood brawl, but Slackjaw just points at the door, and we all leave, with Mike pointing at our backs. Waking up the next day without telling us why, Slackjaw motions for us all to follow. He still can't say a word, so we just come along. We stop at the docks and Slackjaw boys, buys, actually pays coin for it, heavy, heavy chain covered in hooks. It's for fishing in the deep, something you'd attach to a long line off the side of a ship. It's about four feet, made of tick links, and there are shark hooks coming off at different angles. Slackjaw's got that thing wrapped around his left arm, dangling at his side. Not sure how he knew where Mike the Fish was staying, but when we reached his girl's house, Slackjaw throws a bottle through the window just like that. It's almost noon. There's a bunch of screaming inside, and Mike pokes his head out, looking wild eyed and baffled. When he sees Slackjaw out in the street, look comes over his face and still gives me the willies. Pure murder. Mike comes out the side door, bellowing like a, a blood ox, uh, holding a cleaver, heading straight for Slackjaw. 
When they came together in the streets, Slackjaw spins and the shark hooks bite deep into Mike's arm and shoulder. He screams but Slackjaw holds onto the chain. He's standing there with his jaw broken, clenched tight, with the chain wrapped around his left arm, his hook sunk deep into Mike the fish, just knifing him as fast as he can. Um, Mike can't, couldn't fight very well, hooked like that, using his left hand, but he was a big guy and it took a lot of stabbing before he went to his knees. Everyone was cheering at first, but then we all went quiet. Just kept going and going until it was finally just Mike the fish blubbering and crying and the sound of Slackjaw's knife. When it was over, and here's the brilliant part, Slackjaw took out a note and stuck it to Mike's face with a nail. It just said, if you want a job, come to Bottle Street. Slackjaw didn't talk right for a couple months, but word spread fast. By the end of the year, once we had a sizable gang going, he sent letters to the other bosses telling them that he was running a brand new crew over in Bottle Street. Most of them laughed or beat up the guys who delivered the letters. Green eyed Trish even came back missing a tom, but apparently Slackjaw was expecting that kind of reaction and had a backup plan. A week later, four of the bosses were dead. It seemed like a series of unfortunate events, but everyone knew better. One shot dead by the watch while standing in the middle of a meat market, another slipping and falling into the water out cold. Uh, one of the older bosses found in, in the bed with his belly opened wide and the TV and pear stuffed in his mouth. So I'm not sure what that meant. And, um, I guess, I guess uh, you know, stuffed like a pig, you know, a pig with an apple in his mouth kind of thing. Mm. Still not, um, still not sure what that meant. And Sheila Barnesworth was found bubbling in a cauldron of hot wax. Slackjaw sent out another set of letters, offers to the underbosses, telling them that they'll be treated fair as peers. He sent Green Eyed Trish one of the letters. All of the underbosses accepted. After spilling the guts of his main competition, Slackjaw went first stabilizing his business, real neat like going in favors, smoothing things over, giving everyone a bit of coin or drink as a bonus, showing w what he could be like as a boss. So everything got quiet, which was always makes the boys to see watch nervous, of course. Word went out among the um, Royal Mind Master's snitches, the responsible citizens group they called themselves, telling everyone working in a shop or sweeping off the front steps of their homes to keep a watch eye for Slackjaw and his men, trying to suss out what they're up to and what happened. But Slackjaw ain't stupid. He greased a few palms among shopkeepers in the watch too, telling them that he was in town to stay, that things would be run properly from now on, without so much blood. So a real boss, ready to settle into business of moving whiskey, running the hound fights, and offering up the ladies and gentlemen of the night if you take my meaning. Then the plague came. First it seemed like a good thing. A few people got sick, and everyone wanted to buy those potions from Sokolov or Piero. Health elixir or spiritual remedy, called they call them. Slackjaw called me, uh, t Slackjaw told me he could saw an opportunity. We already had an old whiskey factory with a still, where we could water down, the bar water stuff down and sell it discounted. So doing the same with that's uh, with doing the same with with Sokolov's elixir was a smart plan. Pretty soon, everybody in the slums was sick and business was good. But after a while, there's so many people down with the plague uh, that everyone got scared. Everybody started acting real nasty, and everything fell apart. When people can't work, they don't have the coin for elixir. Watered down or pure. When the empress died. It seemed like Dunwall would slide into the void. Spymaster Burroughs took over. The watch started all using all that new Sokolov technology. Uh, watchtowers, tall boys, the mark pylons. They put up a wall of light across Clavering Boulevard and cracked down hard. But Slackjaw surprised us again. Instead of leaving town on a boat bound for Morley or one of, those, one of the other isles, he stayed and kept it together. We get as much elixir to fight off the plague as the city watch with other taxes and rations. That's kept us alive so far. Crowley, Bottle Street Gang. Okay, two more books, I think. Yes, two more. And I'll never be taking these to make damn sure. They like, you know, you know. Rumors and sightings, doubt. Except from an overseer's covert field report. Now this is the thing I read before. Uh. uh where is it? There's just something in here that's not quite accurate. Uh, I, anymore. But then again, maybe it's a bias of the uh, person who's reading it, uh, who's writing it. Remember, religious zealot, they're not going to be particularly accurate. Well, a zealot of any flavor is not going to be particularly accurate about his enemies. Even uh, As much as they try, they may just slump them all together. Let me just check the time. 
Uh, I, uh, I got a few moments. Excerpt from an overseer's covert field report. For over a year now, I've lived far away from, I've lived away from the Abbey, without the company of my overseer brethren, or the guidance of the blind sisters of the Ocular Order? I don't think that's ocular, but I'm not sure on the word. Regardless, uh, days have passed with me sleeping in the dens of Cuphurst's murderers and worse, and the knights have seen me prowling through the worst alleys and wretched corners of Dunwall. I've taken my meals with killers. I've taken my meals with killers. At times I've ventured beyond city walls, meeting in forgotten graveyards and outlying ruins, frequented by those of ill means. My beard has grown long, and I wear the weather clothing and bits of boiled leather favoured by the Bottle Street and Hatter gangs. By those uh, and by those rough men and women who make do their tr trade knifing others in return for coin, my hands run red with blood. It's true, but I've selected my targets with care, choosing amongst those criminals and heretics who are not fit to live, and executing them justly, and using their deaths to means to building my reputation. So far, this trick has allowed me to make my name amongst my murderous colleagues, who have taken the lives of the innocent. My goal is singular. I must impress the assassin named Dowd in order to get close to him. Of all the practitioners of black magic we've tracked, none concern the Abbey as much as Dowd. It is said that his mother was a witch from one of the archipelagos off the Pandasian coast, taken captive by pirates, venturing far from the Isles. According to legend, by the time the ship returned, the captain was dead, the witch controlled the crew, with Dowd still a shadow in her belly. The earliest stories tell of a gang killer without mercy. Uh, moving amongst the shopkeepers and city watch officers of Dunwall, like a reaper through wheat. Then a period of silence followed. Years, we now believe, he spent travelling the Isles, studying anatomy and the occult, the great halls of learning, and hidden basements frequented by federal dabblers in the forbidden arts. Dowd is even purported to have spent a, wi a winter in the Academy of Natural uh, Philosophy itself, and for a time, before a schism developed, uh, he counted a great more witches among his allies. In the DLC, he doesn't actually know who the fuck they are. Apparently. He doesn't really know details on them or their leader and whatnot. So it seems like it could that could be incorrect, or maybe there's more information to it. Maybe he knew of the Brigmore Witches, but not of their ba base and their leader. One second, folks. Hey, uh, folks, and I'm back. Though, quite regrettably, I'm afraid I'm going to actually have to end this here. Um, uh, He counted among the Brigmore Witches, uh, but, oh yes, yes. But maybe there's extra details that aren't said here uh, about, you know, about that that actually makes sense. But at the same time, maybe they changed it in the lore uh, that he used to ally with them, but now dust. And, well, sorry. Uh, maybe there, maybe this is still canon. Maybe this is accurate and there's just details we don't have. Or maybe this was, the lore was changed by the time the DLC came out. Maybe they retaught, rejigged some things. That happens. I just wish it happened before they'd you know, put this book in the game, you know? But regardless, I'll come back to reading that in a moment, uh, in next set. I'm just going to save this here, and I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this. Why Overseer Campbell? I guess we know what, who we're going after now. So yes. Um, yes, I'll come back to reading that book, and the last one, next time. And I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this, and I'll be back soon to record more. Till then, folks, adios.